Iran is not afraid of any country or person for that matter, except for one person, Donald J. Trump. Iran is scared shitless of Trump. Trump is even crazier than the Iranians. Trump was the guy who ordered the assassination of Soleimani. I mean, the most highly ranked general ever in Iranian history. Trump was the guy who imposed huge sanctions on Iran. If you're Iran, you're sitting there, you're two weeks away from a nuclear breakout. You might be thinking to yourself, if Trump is going to return as president, even if you think that there's any chance, you might decide to make a run for nuclear immunity before the US election. The only country that could stop Iran from going for it Hi everyone, Daniela Camboni here for ITM Trading. I'm just back from vacation, feeling refreshed, recharged, ready to go and provide you with incredible content and interviews. But before we get to that today, I just wanted to remind you and urge you to book a Calendly appointment with one of my incredible colleagues at ITM Trading. Why? Well, you saw what happened during that global stock meltdown last week. But what is resilient in the face of all of this? Gold. It is the ultimate wealth preservation tool. And that's why I urge you all to book a strategy session where one of my colleagues will help you build a wealth preservation strategy centered around owning physical metals. It's free, it's educational, and I strongly urge you to waste no more time and get to it and book that Calendly. All right, let's get to today's interview. Softening U.S. labor market, declining consumer confidence in 2024, weakening retail sales and disappointing restaurant industry trends are signaling a cautious outlook as we head into the U.S. election in November. But what's going to be the ultimate thing that will bite the economy in the butt? As my next guest says, please welcome back to the show, David Wu, host of uh, David Wu Unbound. Uh, David, so good to be back with you. Welcome back to the Daniel Bonner me. Show here on ITM. No, it's great. Great to be on your show. So, of course, I want to talk the economy. Of course, we're going to talk the economy with you. But, you know, we're also going to get into to politics. And I'm just going to, you know, cue this up because... Uh, during the assassination attempt of Donald Trump, David, uh, you immediately came to mind uh, because folks that watched your last interview with me, and this is why it's so important to watch channels like ours, is you had predicted a few months ago that there would be an assassination attempt on Donald Trump's life. If Trump continues to run like way ahead of basically Biden, that will be a good thing for the market. I mean, to the extent that they're less likely to do some really nasty things like, you know, assassination and all that kind of stuff. Basically, if Trump has a big lead. Now, of course, you don't have a crystal ball, but you obviously have very good intuition. So we're going to get more thoughts on, uh, from you on where you think this narrative is, is, is going. Uh, but first and foremost, how are you doing? I'm doing as well as it's possible, given the circumstance. I'm in Israel, as you know, and we are yes. bracing for an attack. And I think actually it could come as early as this week. And I think actually wow. there's definitely a disconnect between Wall Street and the Middle East right now in terms of like, you know, the possibility of something like this happening, because if there's going to be an attack, let me tell you this. Like everything you might take for granted, you know, as a given about the investment thesis, this and that, it will be all thrown up into midair. And I can tell you that this is, this is why actually for me personally, you know, actually I've been doing a lot of errands today because we're trying to, I even ordered some dog food, extra dog food just in case. I, I know you did a segment on this, David, where you basically said that Wall Street is ignoring uh, the Iranian threat. Why do you think that is? You know, you know, you know the famous story about you know basically uh, the cry wolf, basically uh, you know problem, right? I mean, like you know, right. I mean, since October seven, there have been many instances where everybody was crying wolf, and then Wall Street drove up basically oil, drove down stocks, basically in anticipation of World War Three in the Middle East. But until now, they haven't happened, and this is why people don't want to get 
fool into thinking that this is going to happen now this time. But you know what? I've always said, like, you know what? This is the problem with, you know, depending too much on history to make predictions. Because, like, every time, this time is very different. I mean, let me just tell you why I think this time is so different, actually. Please. Because this has a lot to do with the U.S. election, actually. You might find it interesting enough, right? If you recall, right, the last time we faced a similar situation was back in April. On April 1st, Israel assassinated an Iranian general in Damascus. And on April 13, you know, Iran retaliated by attacking Israel with about 400 missiles and drones and so on and so forth. Let me tell you that during those two weeks, I was telling my clients, let's not panic. <laughs> okay, please fade this one. This is going to be just a political theater. Why was I so convinced that last time it was not the real thing? It was because guess what? Joe Biden back then was still running for president, if you recall, <laughs> okay? And therefore, Joe Biden had no incentive. I mean, Joe Biden was going to do everything possible to make sure that oil prices didn't spike. Therefore, he had every incentive to basically prevent a regional war, which was the reason why he and his team spent two weeks on the phone with the Iranians trying to orchestrate a, save a face saving <laughs> movie okay, political theater, to basically calm down the Iranians while basically, you know, not getting the Israelis to overreact, okay? So from that point of view, I would argue the fact that Biden was still basically in the race, therefore he cared more than anything else, than the, he cared about the U.S. economy more than anything else, the U.S. stock market more than anything else, he basically made sure that things did not basically come apart at the scene. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's fortunately or not fortunately, Biden this time is very different because Biden is no longer running for president. And then I would argue, like, you know, in fact, I'm not saying that he, and obviously we all know, like, you know, he's quite bitter. I mean, there have been many, many reports about the fact that he's quite bitter for, you know, about being forced out. I mean, one minute he was the presidential nominee, another minute he was thrown off the bus. Basically, that's what really happened to him. So from that point of view, I cannot imagine, I mean, let's put it this way. I don't believe that, you know, the same incentive he had back in April to do everything to prevent a regional war is still true. In fact, you could argue he probably doesn't care if Kamala Harris were to go on to beat Trump or not, because in fact, if Kamala Harris were to lose to Trump, you know, Biden, you know, people might start saying, oh, wow, we shouldn't, it was such a mistake to have forced out Biden. So therefore, I don't think there is no evidence so far that U.S. is trying to hold back the Iranians. Certainly, there is no evidence that the U.S. is trying to talk the Iranians into, again, another orchestrated, highly, you know, basically uh, staged, you know, attack on Israel that would avoid a regional war. In fact, the only thing the U.S. has been doing of late is that sending more and more, basically, uh, naval vessels to the Middle East. The latest we heard this morning was basically a submarine, okay, capable of carrying basically ballistic missiles. So I, what I'm telling you is that this is why the equation has changed. What, what has also changed is this. Again, this is where the U.S. election, okay, has, is already having many unintended consequences. Think about this, right? The big story yeah. three weeks ago was the fact that Anthony Blinken, who I would argue is the biggest Iran appeaser, okay, in Washington, came out publicly and admitted that Iran is only two weeks away from developing nuclear weapons. Again, Anthony Blinken, you could Google this, you can look it up. Anthony Blinken three weeks ago basically admitted that Iran is two weeks away from securing nuclear weapons. Now, let me tell you, like, that is definitely the expert opinion. He's not saying anything new. I mean, in fact, the, you know, the, the consensus in the nuclear community is that Iran is probably about one month away from getting their hands on five nuclear bombs, in fact. Now, now you might say, well, so what does that mean? Like, let's, let's put it this way. You know, Iran is not afraid of any country or person for that matter, except for one person. And that person's name is Donald J. Trump. Iran is scared shitless of Trump. And the reason is because, you know what? Trump is even crazier than the Iranians, okay? Trump was the guy who ordered the assassination of Soleimani, 
I mean, the most highly ranked general ever in Iranian history. Trump was the guy who imposed huge sanctions on Iran. Therefore, if Iran, just think about this, if you're Iran, you're sitting there, you're two weeks away from a nuclear breakout, you might be thinking to yourself, like, if Trump is going to return as president, even if you think that there's any chance, you might decide to make a run for nuclear immunity before the U.S. election. And that's what this is all about, because the only country that could stop Iran from going for it is, of course, Israel. And I think that was the message that Bibi Netanyahu brought to U.S. Congress when he addressed Congress two weeks ago. Like, he's basically said in so many words, okay, without spelling everything out, like, you know, we'll do what, is, what it takes to stop Iran, but just give us the weapons. And I think from that point of view, this is why this time around, you know, in basically August 2024, you're looking at a totally unpredictable situation. And I think a very dangerous situation because everything's at stake. Because in many ways, again, the U.S. election, okay, means that Iran has an incentive to go for nuclear immunity. And because Biden has been forced out of the race, he may not have the same incentive <laughs> to stop yeah. the war from basically completely breaking up. So I think from that point of view, like this is where like it's actually very interesting because I, I, I think a lot of Americans, they just think, oh, wow, there's an election coming. They don't really see how the U.S. election is so important for the world that it's having already many, many consequences even before the election day. Let me ask you this, David. Let's say if you are correct, and I hope, I hope you're wrong, <laughs> that Iran uh, will attack, you know, possibly as early as this week. Um, what's next? Well, let me tell what you happens this. after? Yeah. What happens after? I mean, Israel will have to retaliate. I mean, let's, by the way, just so that, you know, I don't know when you're going to be uh, releasing this video. But I've been saying this for a few days now, and just whammo this morning, we had new news. The Israeli government has reversed its prediction, and this morning basically issued, you know, you could call it a guidance to Israeli citizens, basically saying that they now believe that Iran could attack even before this Thursday. Okay? Wow. So that's number one. So the Israeli government is issuing guidance to Israeli citizens to basically get ready and prepare themselves. And this is why I was doing... You know, basically, I was buying, you know, extra dog food actually this morning. And at the same time, we also had news this morning that Hezbollah, Iran's basically proxy in Lebanon, has vacated its headquarters in Beirut. <laughs> okay, presumably going underground in anticipation of Israeli attack and so on and so forth. Okay. And yes, just yesterday, a member of the Iranian parliament, okay, who's also a member of the national security, basically came out and basically said that an Iranian attack on Israel could last between three to four days. Moreover, the head of Hamas, the butcher of Gaza, Sinwa, who was expected to attend this new round of negotiation with Israel and Egypt, basically this Thursday, just this morning, he said, I'm not coming. Okay. So what I'm saying is that there are, there are a lot of telltale signs that things are starting to basically uh, move in a not so pleasant direction. Yes. So I think the point here is that if Ron were to hit Israel, and then I think there's no doubt like they're going to come in a very big way, in my humble opinion. Okay. And Israel will have to retaliate. Okay. And then if there's retaliation involved, like literally, like, I mean, let's put it this way. Okay. Oil price obviously will skyrocket right away because let's think about it this way, right? Under Joe Biden, okay, you know, the U.S. stopped enforcing existing sanctions on the Iranian oil export. As a result, mm -hmm. Iranian oil export, which two years ago was only a, at about 150,000 barrels per day, is now at 1.5 million barrels per day. Okay. Just imagine if even a fraction of that were to all of a sudden be taken off the market. Okay. I mean, oil price can go to 90, 100, 120, who knows? I don't know. Iran might even decide to, if Israel were to attack Iran, Iran might even try to retaliate by, you know, I don't know, sabotaging, you know, Saudi oil fields, who knows? Okay, anything's possible. But what I'm saying to you is that I think this is actually a big deal right now, because especially given, you know, there are signs of a slowdown in the U.S., the U.S. stock market had a pretty meaningful drop. 
I think, you know, in any event, you know, like all we need is another shock and then here we go. Okay. Let's, I'm, I'm happy you brought up that shock because as I was saying, I just came back from vacation and, you know, here I am overseas, David, I'm watching the global meltdown. I'm watching what's happening to the Dow, to the S&P, to the NASDAQ thinking this is it, you know, and by the time I get on the plane, take the flight home back to New York City, everything was okay again. <laughs> it's like, poof, all the problems disappeared. I'm like, wait, what happened in those nine hours? <laughs> I was flying, you know, back to New York City. My question to you, David, is what, what, how did they get the rebound and what are they going to punch again? I mean, this is obviously not the reality. And I know you speak so much of this, of the disconnect between the real economy and what's happening in the S&P. But what is happening? Who's waving that, that wizardry wand? The Fed? No, I think ironically, you know what? You know what it is? I would say retail investors. <laughs> you know, it's actually very, it's actually, you know, it's actually very interesting because, you know, like, you know, retail investors, they don't matter until they do, okay? And I think, you know, there's no doubt, like, I think on Monday last week or Tuesday, by the way, I just so that you know, like, I was short the market. I was very long yeah. of it. And then I closed out my position literally, like, I think in 11 a.m., basically New York time on Monday. <laughs> At the basically high. So it was great, okay? So from that point of view, there's no question. I think, you know, we also have to take the price action last week with a bit of grain of salt because a lot of it had to do with Japan. And I was right. actually, I was trading the yen the whole entire way. Actually, one of the reasons why I'm up almost 10% year to date for my institutional, you know, basically our portfolio is because like I was long the yen. I knew this was coming. But also by Monday, I realized that the yen, you know, basically a surge was you know, nearing, you know, the ninth inning. So I took profit on my long yen position. At the same time, I took profit on my long VIX position. And that turned out to be very good timing. Okay. So I think from that point of view, what happened last week? Now, you might say, well, okay, fine. You know, you say, well, okay, fine. You look at a chart. If all you have in front of you is basically chart of VIX, you say, well, VIX exploded on Monday and then collapsed, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, mm -hmm. That pattern of a spike in VIX followed by a collapse is a sign of complete capitulation. Mm -hmm. And you could basically argue that this should be an all clear sign that you should now be basically buying stocks with both fists because like everybody's out. But that would be a mistake because there, there was absolutely no cooperation that there was actually, you know, a capitulation event. In fact, if anything, if you actually look at other indicators such as you know the advance and decline ratio <laughs> i mean all we had was a little bit of rotation actually out of tech into everything else okay so if you look at the advanced decline line of s p 500 and compare with let's say what happened in april when we last had a major correction it looks completely different this was nothing if you look at the aai you know basically uh the individual investor sentiment survey i mean <laughs> It never even dropped below zero, by the way, last week, which is right. quite remarkable. Right. Okay? If you look at, you know, the CFTC futures data that were released on Friday, it was fascinating. Yeah, the market had gone from short yen to now long yen, but the market was every bit as long S&P, Russell 2000, and NASDAQ as the week before or the week before that. So what I'm telling you is this. I mean, you know, like, the reason is very simple. I, I think, you know, I, I'm of the view, and you probably know, like, I, I'm very much of the view that, you know, that generative AI has created a bubble. And this bubble has, in some sense, no question, this bubble has extended the U.S. economic expansion, okay, by driving mm -hmm. up CapEx spending and by driving up stock market valuation. And the generative AI has actually, you know, in many ways, ushered in a period of virtual circle for the U.S. economy, boosting productivity growth, driving up stocks, and then, you know, offsetting the interest rate hikes by the Fed and so on and so forth, all the good thing. But I think this is, but, but the premise of this generated AI, which is that this is going to be a profit machine, 
that basically it's going to basically, you know, create four trillion dollars of profit in 10 years. OK, for right. basically companies around the world is going to add productivity growth to everybody. That basically premise is starting to be basically called into question. And I think this is the most important. Listen, every bubble, I mean, bubble of this magnitude, it's not going to burst overnight. It's, I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, I've, I've seen many bubbles in my life. Bubbles don't just basically like, especially such a hype bubble. And by the way, this is the interesting thing. If you think about this, AI has been around for a very long time. I mean, for at least 20 years. I've been basically right. using AI for the last 20 years. You ask yourself, what does basically, what makes generative AI unique? What makes it unique is the fact that, you know what? Yeah, so it's designed to create, okay, content like text, video, audio, and so on and so forth. Things are easy to relate to. So as a result, generate AI, I don't know about its virtue, its only virtue so far is that it's easy to relate to and it's user friendly. Any basically idiot can basically use it, so to speak. You know what, this is the reason why it got so much hype, because it was, it was accessible, everybody can understand what it's trying to do and so on and so forth. But I think that, you know, but it makes no sense that since ChatGPT was launched in November 30th, 2022, in the last, essentially the two and a half years, the market capitalization of S&P 500 has gone up $10 trillion. Even though earnings per share has been flat during this entire period. All this because people think that generate AI is going to be basically like minting gold. Okay. I think that finally has been called into question. People are starting to wake up to the realization that, you know, two and a half years into this, how come Nobody has actually come up with a killer app. How come basically like, you know, we haven't seen a real significant pickup in terms of revenue. I mean, this year, US is going to spend $300 billion on AI chips, but revenue that could be attributed to the AI is probably no more than $30 billion. Okay, that's what we're talking about right here. So I think this is why I think the AI bubble has burst. Okay. And I think what happened last week, sure, you know, you've got all these retail guys whatever, been waiting to buy basically Magnificent 7 on the cheap, that kind of thing. You know, the stock market went right. down, came in and bought. But again, you know, if you're into basically technical analysis, this is Elliott Wave, you know, basically the fourth wave, you know, market has a bit of an impulsive recovery. But I think we're actually very close to the beginning of the fifth wave, which means down. Yeah. So I think that the real situation is yes to come down, down. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So it was just a, it was just a little prelude, a little taste of pain it's to right. come, David. I, I I personally think so. I mean, because again, uh, you know, because the hype yeah. is over. The hype is over because, like, even you know, like even mainstream media is starting to publicize the limitations of generate AI. So even retail guys are going to sit home and basically read about, oh, wow, maybe generate AI is not the panacea, okay, that's uh, the cure-all, that's going to make everybody rich. And I think that is going to be a problem. Let me ask you this. I know um, you, 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 you did a whole segment on recession. I want to get your thoughts on where are we at with this? Because like you mentioned 12 months ago, uh, you know, the yield curve was signaling a recession. Everyone was in, you know, agreement. All the smart people in the room. Yeah, we're definitely going to get a recession. We're getting a recession. Now, yes, there's some that would argue, well, we are in a recession, but technically not in a recession. Um, is it coming? Is it something we still need to fear? I, I, think, I, I think the probability is going up. There's no question about that. Because, again, the reason why we didn't get a recession last year was because of generative AI. Okay. I mean, honestly, that was the reason because generate, just think about this, right? You know, if for nothing else, you just had an increase of $10 trillion in market cap. That's an increase of $10 trillion in terms of wealth, positive wealth. Okay. And so as a result, basically, you know, who care if the Fed was raising interest rates? Like people didn't feel it, okay, if you had that kind of basically appreciation in the wealth right. for Americans, okay? So basically, right. as I said before, a year ago, I mean, by the way, I was not in the recession camp last year. Because of AI, I understood what was going on. But again, most 
economists, I think and a lot of macro investors, because they didn't understand this AI story, they were still basically in this, okay, uh, inflation, interest rates, and then economy always responds to interest rates and that kind of thing. So they didn't understand how AI bought time for the expansion and has pushed out the recession. But now I think the AI bubble having burst, it becomes a very different story. Right. Okay, so I think from that point of view, the economy becomes vulnerable just because, and now the question is, you know, like, because I think, I think the whole AI, you know, sell off definitely is not over. I mean, I could see NASDAQ going down another 10, 15, maybe even 20%, okay, from here. And I think that will represent a big shock, I think, to the system. And then on top of that, if we have any kind of geopolitical risk blowing up, or for that matter, U.S. election risk. I mean, we haven't talked about that, the U.S. election. I mean, I think the fact that, you know, basically the race is now getting closer and closer, okay, that creates uncertainty, okay? And, you know, if the stock market ignored the election early in the year because everybody was so convinced that Trump was going to win and Trump was good for the stock right. market, clearly this is much less clear cut now. So I think you got to think like what is going to be basically there to protect the, you know, the stock market. I was, yeah, sure, the Fed can do it, but I don't think the Fed is going to cut 50 basis points without NASDAQ going down another 10% between now and basically the next Fed meeting in September. So to answer the question I, I brought up at the start, what could bite the market in the butt? It's AI for you. AI is the elephant in the room. There's no doubt, I think it's AI. I think the AI, absolutely, I think the AI as a pillar of the economy, okay, now only has two legs to stand on, okay? And, and that is, is wobbling and then, you know, and I think this is gonna be a big problem. I think on top of that, you know, I think, you know, you've got geopolitical headwinds, you have political headwinds, and then you, I, and I don't see anything out on the horizon that's gonna be able to build us out. Okay, so like, you know, yeah, the Fed might cut, but then again, you know what, the market is already pricing a lot. I mean, right now it's like, well, the market is pricing like four cuts before between the hell the end of the year. So from that point of view, like, you know, the Fed will only deliver these cuts, in fact, if the stock market were to keep going down. So from that point of view, there's nothing to give in the system. And, and, and I think, you know, when, when there's no place to go, <laughs> the market typically goes down, in my view. Well, when there's no place to go, let's talk about um, gold performance through this all. What did you make of the yellow metal and its it resilience? It was fascinating. Um, I have to say it was very, very interesting. I mean, the fact that gold, we had a, we had a, because I was long gold, which I also closed out. Okay. I was very disappointed. I was like, well, we had explosion in VIX, the stock market was yeah. collapsing and then right. gold couldn't rally. You know, and, and that, I think, you know, really gets to the heart of the matter. Because honestly, you know, if you watch or look at CFTC numbers, I mean, Mark is very long gold. <laughs> so, like, from that point of view, again, you know, this is why, like, you know, you know, sometimes what feels like, what feels like the right trade when it's already crowded, it probably is not the right trade, okay? If everybody else already has got it on. Now, I'm not, this does not take away from the fact that I think gold over the medium term will do very well. I think next year gold is going to do very well because I think next year, I don't care who's going to be the president, okay? Next year, the focus is going to be very much on fiscal risk, okay? Because next year, you're going to have massive refinancing requirements, huge issuance. Yep. I mean, next year is going to be crazy, okay? But the point here is that this year, for the time being, I think, first of all, I think, first of all, the, the failure of gold to, to serve, I mean, to basically, uh, to fulfill his uh, promise as a safe haven last week was definitely disappointing. It points to the fact that the market is already long gold. And then when you have margin calls, when you're long stocks and everything else, and you're getting stopped out, you're stopping out everything, including your, you know, your long gold position. I think that's one reason. Another reason is it tells you once again, that again, there's still a lot of belief in the, AI, the Magnuson 7 story, that, you know, people I, I, are, you know, because again, gold, you buy gold when, you know, like you've completely gone pessimistic on everything. So again, it, what it tells you is that the, the sort of the, uh, you know, the buzz, the bubble of, you know, AI 
has not quite burst yet. Okay. Okay. And but that, wait, wait, David, David. Not, not, but I just want to bring this up and I'll let you finish it because, okay, you didn't get this, tr the rally you were looking for, but, uh, you know, others would argue, but it, gold did what it should be doing and it was, you know, holding steady, it was at least preserving wealth when everything else was tanking. Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, you can look at it that way, but I, I would argue that, you know, usually gold does very well when you know uncertainty goes up uncertainty went up a lot gold didn't basically go up two gold did well your gold is supposed to do very well when interest rates go down when the opportunity cost of holding gold goes down and a massive rally in treasuries treasuries massively outperformed gold i mean the last basically two weeks yeah. right so i think from that point of view like there's no doubt I, I think a lot of people you know like people buy gold also as a hedge Right. The idea is that gold should be your insurance policy. Everything else goes down. Gold should be going up to offset your losses elsewhere. I mean, if you just want something that doesn't basically go anywhere, you might as well just basically park your money in cash. Right. That doesn't go anywhere. So from that point of view, I think, you know, you know, but but again, I can understand why some people are a bit disappointed. I was disappointed. But I think, again, you know, you know, I, I don't think, you know, it was an indictment against gold. I mean, I think, you know, it just tells you that short term, the mark, you know, the market is it's crowded. Everybody's already long gold. But I think, again, if you have a 12 month horizon, I think gold is going to do very well, especially if I'm right. Uh, that this AI bubble has burst and then this got and then the, uh, the deflation of the AI bubble has a long way to go. Final thought here as we wrap, uh, you know, I, I brought up the fact that um, during the assassination attempt, you know, that, that interview uh, you did with me quickly came to mind. I said, wow, David absolutely forecasted, predicted that. And I remember at the time, the comments, people thought you were crazy, right, David? Like, they're like, oh, you're talking an assassination attempt. This is just crazy talk. But nothing's crazy talk anymore. I mean, that's exactly what happened. So my question to you now is, well, one, what did you think? Because uh, I know you emailed me right away as well. So we were both on the same wavelength. Um, you know, it's obviously not something you want to be right about. But two, what do you think is next? I mean, were you, were you shocked to see the Harris card take over the Biden card? Yeah, so let's talk about this. I, I think, you know, basically, I, my view is this. Like, I, 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 I mean, listen, again, we're never going to get to the bottom of this. That's the honest truth. But I think there's only a 50% chance. When I said that, you know, I don't know, like I said, well, there's a 50% chance. You know, I think there's a 50% chance and no more than 50% chance that this was the long, the work of a long wolf, right? Who knows, right? So like, if it's not the work of long wolf, and again, I have no proof. That's why I say it's 50-50. If it's not the work of long wolf, then you could argue that they might try again. <laughs> By the way, I actually think that Trump agrees with me that they might try again. I think this is the reason why he immediately basically made, <laughs> chose, you know, you know, J.D. Vance as his running mate. Because if you think about this, like J.D. Vance makes no sense as a, right. you know, basically as a VP, essentially candidate for Trump. I mean, after all, like, you know, he's just a mini Trump. I mean, he's, he, he, you know, he's from Ohio. I mean, Trump is going to win Ohio anyway. Okay. And J.D. Vance is not going to help bring on any women, Hispanics, Blacks, whatever it is. So, it, electorally speaking, at least, I think J.D. Vance is one big fat zero. So the question is, why did Trump pick him? My theory is that Trump is trying to send a message to whoever might want to take him out, which is, if you're taking me out, you're going to end up with someone just exactly like me, maybe a little worse. Okay. So I actually think that the choice of J.D. Vance, which was made three days after the assassination attempt, probably tells you what was going through Trump's mind. And I think, you know, that's why he kept saying at the convention, you know, I was not supposed to be here. And I think that speaks volume about, you know, like, you know, maybe still a lot of concerns in his head about what really happened and what could still happen. Now, interesting. So let's yeah, just take that out. But right now, given that, you know, Kamala Harris is doing very well and like, I, I don't think anybody's going to want to take out Trump, right? I mean, you only take out Trump if you think that, you know, that he's going to win, right? Now, the question is, and I've been saying this for the last few weeks to my clients, which is that as much as I still think Trump is going to win, I think, you know, you know, I, I thought that, you know, basically Kamala is in a 
honeymoon period, and I think she'll continue the surge in the poll. Okay. And I, I still stand to that view. I think she will do well for three more weeks. Okay. At least up to basically the, the Democratic Party convention. I mean, the reason why she's doing so well is because, of course, as you and I know, she has not given a single interview, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. to the mainstream media. In other words, she has not really had her feet held to fire, <laughs> okay? And the mainstream media right now is all basically cuddling her. You know, they said, well, you know, she's new. We want to give her a chance and so on and so forth. So I would argue the entire mainstream media in the United States is working for her. Okay, they're giving her all the benefit of the doubt. This is why, like, you know, so this is a lot of feel good kind of thing. And that makes sense. But once we get to September after Labor Day, everything's going to change, of course. Right. I mean, because you, you cannot go all the way to November without giving interviews. Right. And on top of that, this is why Trump decided to, you know, basically, you know, agree to debate her. Not just once, but maybe three times. But I think Trump probably feels like he doesn't have much of a choice anymore. At this point, that the only way he can expose her is by basically, you know, you know, essentially debating her. Okay. Now, of course, that is not without a risk to Trump, right? I mean, this is why it wasn't clear because for men to debate a woman already, like, you know, you could argue that, you know, the optics already favors her over him and so on and so forth, especially he's white and she's not white and so on and so forth. So she'll get the sympathy votes and all that. And Trump knows that. That's why it was not an easy call, I'm sure, for him to agree to basically debate her even once, let alone three times. Three times is a necessity, in my view. But most importantly, and I think this is the, the most important, I think it's nonsense in the, in the poll that came out basically today shows how Americans trust Kamala Harris with the economy more than they trust Trump. That makes no sense to me. In fact, I think this is where it's getting interesting, Danielle. If I turn out to be right, that stocks yeah. are still going lower and the economy is going to set to slow further. Who knows? There could be a, basically a war in the Middle East to send oil prices up to whatever. Okay. That will basically do more than anything else to help Trump. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's the great irony because right now it's like, well, if the economy is okay, then, you know, maybe economy is not such a big issue. You know, and people might vote for a big smile, nice smile, but if the economy basically comes back onto the radar in a very big way and people start to worry, there's no doubt. I think this is going to play to Trump's advantage. And this is why my call on the stock market on the bursting AI bubble also is consistent with my prediction that Donald Trump still stands a very, very good chance in winning November. I always appreciate your, your, your uh, obviously our economic, but your political insights, uh, David. And if I may add, um, you know, you say how Vance was not a, you know, traditional pick, kind of unconventional, kind of out of, you know, left field. You could make the same argument uh, for Harris's selection, though. That was, a, that was a terrible call, by the way. That, that was, I, I think that, that call is going to basically hurt her in a very big way. Because, again, you know, as you and I know, right, in a primary election, you run at the extreme end of your party. <laughs> but in a basically general election, the winners are always trying to occupy the middle ground. Right now, like, she is surrendering the middle ground to Trump. And I think from that point of view, that, that, I think that was a mistake. Now, obviously, I don't tell you there are a lot of pressure. On, I mean, you know, I thought that she should have even at least gone with, what's his name? You know, Kelly in Arizona did go with Waltz, right? I mean, forget about Josh Shapiro. Let's just say Josh Shapiro, he's Jewish, yeah. and then he's pro-Israel. But, you know, even then, by the way, if she really wanted to paint herself as a centrist, she should have gone with Josh Shapiro because like 80% of Americans in polls after polls say that they're pro-Israel. Only 20% say that they're pro-Hamas. And she's pro-Hamas. <laughs> okay. So from that point of view, to bring Josh Shapiro on board will basically help dilute that. Okay. It will basically move her towards the center. She decided not to do that. So I think from that point of view, it's, it's a, I, I, you know, you know, I think that she once again gave in to the pro progressive wing of her party to which she owes her basically ascendancy, okay, as basically a party nominee. Because there's no question that the progressives basically were the ones who rally around her, who basically put up there. And I think from that, <laughs> this is also the reason why Obama did not endorse her until the very, very bitter end. Like, Obama, like me, probably thought that Whitmer had stood much better chance beating Trump. But, but again, I think, you know, in some sense, I think, you know, Harris made a big political mistake, in my humble opinion, by well, going with Waltz. I don't think that's 
going to help her at all. You know, and, and but they just everyone just needs to stop with the staged phone calls, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, anywho, uh, so many phone calls happening like, oh, I didn't know you were calling or, you know, I didn't already have you saved. Like, who could be calling? Anywho, um, <laughs> I'm just trying to make a joke, uh, you know, amidst all the, the horrible news that we're just, uh, you know, surrounded Bye. And David, I, uh, I, uh, praying for your safety, stay safe. And, um, we'll speak soon. Absolutely. Thank God. I've got a, I've got a big, 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 powerful shelter. I mean, practically a nuclear shelter Yeah. Okay, underneath my house. So hopefully I'm going to survive wow. this one. Wow. Well, anyway. and I know you said you were out buying dog food and I appreciate you, um, you know, taking the time. I think you have a lot more important things that you need to be preparing for. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And like I said, we'll see you soon. David Wu, catch him on his show, Unbound. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye. And thanks for watching. We'll have more uh, great content coming your way. It's content you're not going to find anywhere on mainstream media, that's for sure. And that's going to put you ahead of the game. So be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show here on ITM Trading and sign up at Daniela Camboni dot com to stay on top of it all. We'll see you soon.